Hi, and welcome to the fourth episode of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I'm Francis Campoy, and I'm here with my co-host, Mark. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Francis. How are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. Trying to fight the jet lag. What about you? Where, where are you, Mark? I'm in San Francisco. It's relatively early on a Saturday morning here in my living room. That's a great place to be. That's a pr yeah, that's a nice place to be. Um, well, I'm. Where are you hiding? I'm actually hiding somewhere in the south of France. I mean, on my way from Paris to Barcelona, where I'll be next week. Okay, that sounds really, really fun. Sounds like you're getting your travel on. Saturday afternoon, podcast recording. Fun. <laughs> fun. Well, that's pretty exciting. So we have a, a, um, we have a back to the future moment. We have an interview that's going to come up that hasn't even been done yet. Yeah. Uh, so actually I'm going to Barcelona, as I said, I'm going there for DockerCon, uh, where I will be giving a landing talk, but even more important than that, I will be interviewing Jesse Frazell, one of the contributors, well, actually one of the team members of the, uh, Docker engine team where she's going to be talking to us, I hope, because I still don't know, but she will be talking to us <laughs> about containers, what's all the fuss about, and how you get started. It sounds like that's going to be a really interesting interview. I look forward to listening to it. I look forward to actually doing that interview. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So we have, I think, a pretty cool, cool thing of the week uh, this week, and definitely something that sits in your wheelhouse, because it has to do with Go. Yeah, it does. Uh, we re yeah, we released the Google de the Cloud Debugger for Go recently. Yep, uh, which is, in my opinion, a great thing to have. Uh, I could not have named it that, because first time I heard about a debugger on production, I was slightly scared about having breakpoints. On my yeah, that does sound scary. Yeah, I'm just going to stop my processes. Yeah, yeah. but it doesn't. Do it that. doesn't do that at all, actually. Uh, so basically, what the cloud debugger does, uh, both for Java and Go, we have it for for both languages now, is that for any application that is running on Google Compute Engine, uh, you basically set it up first, and then it will allow you to add breakpoints. But actually, those are not real breakpoints; those are snapshot points. So oh, so it like takes a picture of what's going on in your system so you can see what's like happening with like your variables and your call stack and things like exactly. that. Exactly. So you can add, you can add some conditions so you you don't want to take any snapshot. For instance, you can say, "Oh yeah, I want to take a snapshot of this line in this for loop when the index variable is 42 and that's it." So Oh, wow. so it, that's actually really powerful. Yeah, that's great. It's really powerful. It will allow you to see what is the value of all the uh, all the variables in the scope at that point and also the call stack. So you'll be able to understand wow. not only what you're going, what you're doing, but also how you got there. So that's pretty powerful, yeah. So I haven't played with it, but I'm guessing people are gonna be like, so is there a performance issue here? Is there something, you know, I'm running this in production, is that a problem? It's actually not a problem. Uh, taking snapshots will have a very, very tiny impact on your performance, uh, but it's actually uh, good enough that if you have an issue, I could definitely not even think about it, just go for it, try it. Uh, for sure, don't leave it on taking snapshots every second because it's not really useful, but it's something that uh, it's definitely worth the performance cost because also when you, the performance cost is only linked to the point when you actually use it, when you're not using it, you don't have any performance costs. So you're good. Yeah. And, and obviously that performance cost is worth it to solve whatever that issue is that you're having. And if you have to do it on production, it's probably like a really tricky issue. Exactly. It's, it's basically on the order of magnitudes of milliseconds. Like, I don't know if it's like around five milliseconds or something yeah. like that, which is definitely worth it. Like there's worse things that could happen to your production really. So, uh, and yeah. it's going to allow you to basically find the good values for you to test on your code outside of production. And then in there, you can actually use a, an actual debugger and go step by step and understand what's exactly the problem with the code. Or even better, write a bunch of unit tests demonstrating that your code is wrong, then fix it and fix your test with that. Yeah, no, that sounds, yeah. Because sometimes there are just those tricky issues, like 
race conditions that you couldn't bring up in unit tests or are tricky to bring up in unit tests or you didn't even think of stuff that really like it only shows up in production because that's the best place for things to show up obviously but these things happen so it's it's good to have those sort of tools it's good that you mentioned uh race conditions it's actually uh something that i've been talking lately about um so when you have race conditions in Go, one of the best things that you can do is use the data the data race detector, which is as simple oh, nice. as it's as simple to use as when you build your your binary, dash 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 race. That's it. That's everything you need to do, and then it generates a binary that will detect any time that there's a race detect uh, data race. When that happens, yeah. uh, it will emit a warning. So with that, then you can basically every single time such a warning appears, you can analyze your logs and file a bug or something like that. So then you can fix it. If you do that though, you have to be careful because it's not like, it doesn't take snapshots. It's actually much slower. Oh, it's, so it's it, kind of slow. yeah, it will slow down your process quite a bit, even though when there's no races, uh, no data races, which means that it's something that you might want to do as a side server, like you have a test server that it's getting maybe some shadow traffic from production and it's actually trying to handle those. And if it takes longer, it's not really a problem because not really, it's not impacting the productions, uh, the production traffic. It's just getting some of that traffic and if something goes wrong, files the bug directly. So that's also a very useful okay. technique. There you go. One cool cloud thing, one cool go there thing. There you go. Extra, extra cool thing. <laughs> Great. So uh, I think that it's probably time to bring Jessie from the future and start talking with her about containers. What do you think? Sounds great. Excited to hear it. Okay. So we're here with Jessie Frizzell. Hi, Jessie. Hi. <laughs> so we're here at DockerCon. And uh, so that's the DockerCon EU in Barcelona. The second DockerCon that has ever happened? Yes. The second of... Um the European conferences. There's also um, two that happened in the U.S. So. Great. So we've been here. This is the second day. And uh, as far as I've seen, Jesse is not only a well-known person in the Docker community in San Francisco, but pretty much everywhere else. So I wanted to know a little bit more about what you do at Docker to be so famous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not famous. <laughs> um, I am a core maintainer. Um, so I think that actually that has a lot to do with it. It's um, an open source project and it gets a lot of visibility. Um, and I also am contributing a lot of code for it. Um, most recently um, have been working on adding setcomp to Docker itself, um, which a lot of people have wanted. And I helped uh, try to get in the user namespace pull request, which was also heavily requested. So um, yeah, we work a lot on <laughs> Go and open source in general. Nice. I saw that there was some statistics about the number of, uh, of pull requests that you get per week. How many are those? Um, we get around 200 per week. And actually, we have... Um, <laughs> like even cooler stats um uh my coworker Arno wrote this really cool like go um tool that will get all the open source stats and i found out that i am the person who closes not merges the most pull requests oh <laughs> so maybe that's why you're famous that's oh, <laughs> yeah. maybe not such a good thing after all <laughs> so and how long you've been working at uh docker um a little bit over a year now um nice. i started in september but my first contribution was last June or like the June before that. Okay, um, nice. So yeah, that's how I like became. A that's great. So how did you start? How did you get started with containers? Like uh, containers have been uh, uh, something really important, like the new hot thing in the tech industry for quite a while. Why did you get interested on it? Um, so the startup I was working at before Docker, um, we actually used LXC um, and LXC is, it works, but it's just kind of painful to use. Um, so we switched to Docker at 0 0.5, um, which was kind of rough, but still better than LXC. Um, so then I started getting into the project. I started watching the repo, and um, one thing led to another. <laughs> and nice. here I am. That's very cool. So uh, you started using Docker a little bit because you were already using containers. Uh, LXC yeah. is kind of like containers, just not as easy to use, basically. Totally. Uh, why Why could someone start using containers as a company? Like, how? what is the benefit of running containers rather than just everything directly on bare metal? 
Um, so it allows like your infrastructure to be easily transported from dev into production because you can run it on your Mac, you can run it anywhere. And actually in the first keynote at DockerCon, they showed um, like a new developer starting on their first day. All they have to spin up on their laptop is Docker itself instead of having to get like the whole company stack, like Python, Ruby, all that crap. And Yeah, um, that's very nice. Yeah. Wait yeah, it's basically getting people uh, like the, the development environment inside of the container also. Yeah. That, that's really cool. So, uh, I think that rather than spending time talking about why people should move to containers, cause I, at this point, I'm pretty sure that like most of people actually think that that's a good idea. Uh, I would like to talk about how do you do that? So like if, if you were to move a company from like traditional, t- uh, stack to containers, What could be the first steps? Yeah, so I would say it would be to uh, start, you know, um, taking apart your, like, monolithic things into um, the database, running that in a container by itself, um, whatever proxy you have running that in a container. So just really separating out the microservices um, and then starting to play around with um, maybe the Docker command line and then maybe playing around with the new, like, platform as a service tools that all these different things that have come to like fruition. Yeah. We, we had, uh, last week we had an interview with, uh, Brian Dorsey and uh, he worked for the Kubernetes team and it was quite interesting because he was basically talking about, yeah, like once you go through that step of going from one monolith- monolithic app to you have all of a sudden a bunch of containers and macro services and everything, all of a sudden there's a new set of problems that sit in. So basically like that, that's when you're going to be talking about like uh swarm or Kubernetes or Mesos or whatever yeah. stack that you want to use. And there's so many to choose from now. It's like the world is at your disposal. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really cool. It's kind of scary. I think that at some point we should have an episode talking about what to do. Like, yeah. <laughs> what, are, what are the options there? I think it's a quite interesting topic. Uh, so you mentioned at the beginning of the talk, something that uh, at the beginning of the interview, you mentioned SecComp. Um, security is quite a big deal. I've seen people putting private keys inside of containers and on public repos. That's kind of dangerous. Uh, (laughs) tell, tell us a little bit about what do you think that we should always take care of uh, regarding security with containers? Yeah. So, um, what I'm working on right now is, uh, the first phase is actually SecComp itself, which, um, is, uh, a allow or denying certain syscalls. You can actually even trace, um, et cetera. Um, but, uh, the first phase is actually going to be like this kind of not so easy to use config, but not so complex as something as app armor or something like that. Um, but the second phase of that is actually, uh, one config to rule all security profiles. And then it will have different backends like using seccomp or app armor or, um, SA Linux labels. So you get the ability to like log on right on any file or, um, deny files being written to allow like certain executables to run like P trace, stuff like that. Nice. Um, so basically the idea is that, uh, the same way we have like with OAuth 2, you have scopes and you allow people to do one thing or the other. It's kind yeah. of the same thing, but inside of, of Linux, right? Yeah, totally. It was actually designed, um, and inspired by the Apple, um, APIs and also Android's APIs for security, um, scopes. Cool. Yeah. I've seen, I saw your demo, uh, your landing talk at, uh, not DevOps, but the, the Docker meetup in Belgium, yeah. right? That, that was, that was really interesting. I wonder if that was recorded. If it was, if it was recorded, I'll try to put the link to that on oh, the nice. show notes. Uh, cool. So I'm going to say it again, but you're kind of famous for no. one specific thing, which is running everything in a container. <laughs> like I've seen you running like normal things like, uh, Chrome. But also I've seen you even launching games from Steam on a container, <laughs> which is pretty awesome. And like, it's, it's really amazing. The fact that you're able to do that. People tend to say it's like, Oh yeah, that's too hard, but then you make it look easy. So I wanted to ask you, what is the next crazy thing you're going to do? Or if there's no crazy thing that you can disclose, uh, what is one crazy thing that you've tried and totally failed? Um, so. <laughs> My coworker Arno and I gave a talk yesterday and we had this crazy idea of fitting a Docker image onto a 1.44 megabyte 
floppy disk. And it was all going to go so perfectly. I ordered this um, floppy disk to USB converter and I like translated the page from Spanish so that I could make sure that it ran on Linux. And I like plugged it in when we got it and it was just like totally borked like back in the olden days when you would put in your floppy disk and you just knew it wasn't working right. It was like the exact same sound. Um, so we were like, well, <sighs> but we did create an image that was small enough to fit on one. And like the, the coolest part about it actually was that the binary that was in the image was a go binary built statically. Um, so we could build from scratch and the binary itself was like five megabytes, which is way too big. It's never going to fit. Um, but then w when you put it in the Docker image itself and you do a, a Docker save, um, it will create a tarball, but that tarball isn't compressed. So actually what we did was untar it, then retar it with XZ and like nine compression, the maximum. And it was 1.3 <laughs> megabytes. Nice. So can, that, that's actually very interesting. Can you actually do that in general? Like you, once you have a Docker image, uh, untar it and then tar it with compression and the Docker daemon will be able to handle it. Like if it was a normal image. Yeah. So you can actually, so that XZ, um, compressed image, I could have, Docker loaded it back in. Um, so it actually would be really nice if on Docker save, we could pass a flag, like use this compression level, like either gzip xz um, and like what sort of. Yeah, that, that'd be really nice. Cause nowadays one of the problems that, that I have is if I try to run Docker on my machine and I have like a oh, hotel Wi-Fi or conference Wi-Fi, it's kind of a pain because images tend to be quite big, right? So yeah. that, that could maybe help with that. Yeah, totally. That would be a huge help. That is pretty awesome. The other option, of course, is using Docker machine. Yeah. Uh, which, yeah, there's, there's actually, we'll put on the links, uh, one of my coworkers, Ray T, wrote an, we're a blog post about how to use Docker with a conference hotel, with a conference Wi-Fi. Oh my God, that's so good. <laughs> yeah. So basically you start an instance somewhere like on Google Cloud Platform and then you connect to that and it works really, really well. That's what I do all the time. Now. That's perfect. <laughs> Okay, so you mentioned something that didn't work, the floppy disk. Tell us about something that you think it's it's cool that you've seen lately. Cool. Um, yeah. So actually, um, the stuff with X server that I do is um, all just mounting locally my X11 socket, but you can also actually do this uh, entirely remote on a server. So say you have um, Wireshark, which is uh, has like a GUI. Um, running on a server, you can have a v remote VNC connection and actually show it locally um, on your uh, local instance. Um, so I think that that's kind of neat. And also, like, the fact that you can, like, the difference between VMs and containers is um, sharing namespaces. So the fact that you can have a Wireshark container connected to a different container sharing the same network namespace, you can actually look at all the packets from the other container without exposing everything from your host to um, the Wireshark container itself. Um, so just the fact that Docker allows you to share like net namespaces, PID namespaces, um, it's like super helpful in terms of debugging and the whole like remote VNC X11 thing is also helpful in terms of debugging. So th there's two really cool things in there. One is the fact that, so what you're saying is that you have your containers that is running somewhere and like it, that it's not aware of Wireshark or anything, it's just running there. You want to debug it. And with that modifying that container, you're able to start a new container that will be sniffing those packets with Wireshark. Yeah. So you can actually. Uh, take the network namespace from the container that you want to debug and then run the next container, uh, let's say your Wireshark container or like maybe even a Strace container in that network namespace. And if it was Strace, you could actually run it in the PID namespace of the other container, which is like really, that's it's really fascinating. Powerful. Yeah. Yeah. That's really powerful. <laughs> so basically you can connect to that container with that container, the container that you want to investigate doesn't need to know anything. You don't need to restart it or anything to just yeah. connect there. So it like annihilates the whole need to like exec in, install other and then do what you need to do. You don't need to exec anymore. You can be sure that your debugging tools won't modify the original container. Nice. And yeah. And so that was one of the first, one of the cool things. The other cool thing that, that, uh, that implies is that you can be running graphical UIs, QAs 
on a server and access them like if they were local applications on your laptop. Yeah. Right? So that's through X server, which means that on Linux it works really well. What about Mac? Yeah, Mac would be interesting. I think um, it would probably have to use maybe the same hack that um, is used when people try to run my stuff on um, their Macs, and it involves, like, a SoCat into, like, an X11 Mac instance, and then it fires into the VM. I mean, I'm not really sure on the technical details, <laughs> but um, it's something like magic. <laughs> That's, that sounds quite complicated. Is there any blog post or something that you could point point us to? Uh, yeah, there's actually an issue um, that is closed now, but... Um, on Docker itself where um, someone is mentioning my GUI apps and I think it's like titled like Mac OS X X11. Um, and uh, the person who figured it out posted all the details. And actually I'll get emails still on this issue of people thanking the guy who figured it out. Nice. So uh, it must still work and it must still be legit. <laughs> okay. So I'll check it out and I'll add that link also to the, to the show notes. That sounds really interesting. Nice. So do you think it could be then doable to have something like you have a, Pretty small computer, like a like a like a tiny micro uh, computer, even a Raspberry Pi, maybe. Like imagine that you have a Raspberry Pi and you want to run a quite powerful application that requires CPU. Could you be doing something where like you just care, you just have your X11 server running on the Raspberry Pi, and then the rest of computation is actually sent to some container running somewhere else, and I like. You can have, like, on Google Cloud Platform, you can have, like, 32 cores if you want to. So you could be running, like, a very, very powerful application and it could look like it's running on the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, totally. I mean, you could use VNC and do that. And, yeah, that would actually be a really cool idea, especially in terms of the whole conference Wi-Fi thing. Yeah. You just have the most minimal stuff locally and then everything else is just hitting a remote instance. Yeah, I I, I will definitely try that. That sounds actually really interesting. <laughs> Cool. So, uh, to finish, I wanted to talk a little bit more about your relationship with the Docker community. So, uh, you said that you started working, um, as a, well, you started contributing before you were an employee. Uh, what is your relationship with, like, what is the relationship of Docker with other contributors? How many do you have? How do you handle them? Like, other than closing their PRs with <laughs> emerging nodes, <laughs> what, what, what kind of community, how do you manage that community, basically? Yeah, so um, a lot of our communication is over IRC. Um, we have a channel just for maintainers, which is where we take care of like uh, more like administrative tasks. Um, and then there's the Docker dev channel, where which is where like... We have the bots talking about open PRs. We have uh, maintainers coming in asking us like how they should implement something or um, contributors being like, I hit this while trying to build Docker. Um, it's very like only developing two Dockers, um, yeah. which is really cool. Um, and then also like we have a ton of bots on the repo that help us out in terms of just the sheer volume of pull requests we get. Like yeah. even we were thinking of looking into what Kubernetes bot is because it looked really cool. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, I mean, it's actually really cool, especially the Docker core team in that is employed by Docker as well, because at, every single one of us was contributing to the project before we worked there. Um, so as much as people say, like, you know, Docker is this enterprise company, like we are not, if anything, everyone else at Docker thinks of us as like the hipster kids. Um, <laughs> so like we're very also very opinionated in ourselves. Um, and it's nice to know that like we all came from the community first. So if anything, like my love for the project will always exceed anything else. Um, yeah. I want the project to be good and I want it to be something I want to use personally. Um, and it is something that I use personally. Um, so, I mean, I yeah. think it's great. <laughs> you use every day with every single application. Yeah. You run. <laughs> cool. So how many, uh, just to have an idea, how many maintainers, how many contributors oh, yeah. do you have? Um, contributors, there's like, in the thousands, it's actually gotten so big that GitHub won't show them all if you go on that page. Oh, wow. It will okay. only show like the top, whatever they show. Um, <laughs> so there's, yeah, a ton. Um, maintainers, there's, um, maintainers of the various like subsets of Docker itself, but for the Docker engine, I would say there's 
definitely like five from Docker, the company. And then there's about like 10 external from um, various companies like IBM, Red Hat, and then also just individuals themselves, which is really cool. And students at universities even are maintainers. Nice. That's very nice. Yeah. Okay, so to finish the interview, I had two questions, uh, which is about the coolest things that you've seen. So what is the coolest talk or what's the coolest thing you've learned during DockerCon? Oh, man. This um, DockerCon. <laughs> so this talk that I was just at, actually, this guy was talking about how they run honeypots in containers on their servers. And I was just like, that's a really cool concept. <laughs> for for the listeners that don't know what a honeypot is, because it's not a pot with honey. <laughs> what <laughs> yeah. is a honeypot? Um, it's like... It's put there to kind of try to catch hackers um, as like a, hey, come, this might be open for you. Um, but he didn't really go into details as to what exactly theirs were doing. But it was just interesting that they, one, run them in containers, which is awesome. But two, they just have them spread out on their infrastructure everywhere. <laughs> nice. So it's basically a way of monitoring if someone is actually attacking. Yeah. <laughs> ah, it's really That's really smart. I really like it. And the other cool thing is, what is the coolest feature of Docker for you? Like, what's the thing that you love the most? Um, I mean, I love all features, <laughs> but uh, Docker exec, like, for some reason, it, like, means something personally to me because um, it was, like, my first week working at Docker. And granted, I had contributed to the project before, but um, it was a feature that I really wanted but two, I got assigned to it to try to help it through the process. Um, and it was actually Vish from Google um, who wrote the PR itself. Um, and then I got to merge it. So nice. it was super exciting and fun. And it was like two days before my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> it's a birthday present. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very geeky birthday present, really. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, thank you so much for taking your time to talk with us. And uh, see you somewhere else in a different in a different conference. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you very much to uh, you, Francesc, for setting up the interview and Jesse for joining us. Uh, I'm sure when I listen to the episode in the future, it will be amazing. I know both of you are amazing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jesse, for taking the time off a uh, very, very busy week at DockerCon to have a chat with us. Yeah, so we have a great question of the week uh, from one of our, our previous listeners and one-time pr uh, answer providers. A uh, gentleman by the name of Terence, who's a technical solutions engineer here at Google. He asks a good question, like a debugging style question, which I quite like, which is sort of the situation where it's like, why can't my Google Compute Engine instance connect to a particular API or resource like Cloud SQL or BigQuery or Cloud Data Store? Um, and it, it could be something that I think has probably bitten me a couple of times. Um, so I think it's a, an excellent question. Yeah, uh, yeah, I've seen that before and I've heard people asking those questions before. So I think it's a great question of the week. So, uh, the answer is actually quite simple. It's security. Um, by default, when you create an instance on Compute Engine, uh, the instance will not have access to all the things that you could do. So it will have, it will have access to some of the resources that we also call scopes. So for instance, when you create it, it will have, uh, read only access to Google Cloud Storage, but won't be able to write. So so what do you do if you want uh, if you want that instance to be able to write? So the easiest way is if you're um, creating an instance through the development, like through the console, uh, through the web console. If you go to a tab when you create your instance called Access and Security, you'll see all the levels of API access you have there. Um, and as you said, yeah, you can see that, you know, Cloud SQL is none, BigQuery is none by default, storage is read-only, because security, right? Like, you want to keep things locked yeah. down and only open up the things that you want to, uh, which is great. Um, and that that's a really easy way of saying, oh, yeah, when I created that instance before, maybe I forgot to, like, turn this on, maybe I should go have a look. Um, it's, it's a very quick, you know, it's sort of a very common gotcha. Yeah. Um, though I do like the fact that now there is a button there that says allow API access to all Google Cloud services. That's pretty handy. That's pretty handy, but uh, I could not advise using it as a in general basis. Uh, I think yes. it's very good. If you want to have an instance that you want to test that your code is actually correct and it's just a, an access problem, or if you're actually using that instance to do development, it's, it's a great idea, but it's definitely not a, a good security policy to allow access to 
all the scopes. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a great troubleshooting feature. You know, like let's let's make sure that this isn't something that's um, the problem with what's going on. You know, and then I can go back and say, okay, let's let's scale these security measures back and make sure everything is the way it should be. Yeah, uh, something interesting that not, not, maybe some of our users don't know is when you are in this uh, in the screen that you were talking about before, when you create a dialog where you create a new instance. There's actually at the button, if I remember correctly, something like equivalent REST API or something like that. So or an equivalent G Cloud Ooh. command. So Ooh. that oh. will actually show you how to do the same thing through either the REST API. So it's going to be a JSON object or with the G Cloud command. So that can be quite useful if what you want to do is create that instance with the scope that you need from other, from a place other than the console itself. Oh, that's nice. I, I'm actually looking at that now. That's I, I didn't quite realize that was there. I think I probably knew, but I'd forgotten. But that's like a nice like sort of interactive documentation. I quite it's like a that. very useful thing because sometimes I don't remember exactly, especially in the JSON in the JSON formats. Like, oh, where does it go? What is the parameter in GCloud to create this thing? So it's very very handy. Yeah, that's that's very very cool. I like that a lot. So yeah, if you if you happen to run into a situation where you think you've got your code right. But for whatever reason, you can't access Cloud SQL or something like that from Compute Engine. Make sure to go check your scopes, see if you have access that way, because you may not. Yep. Very good. So uh, to wrap up, I would like to know what are you up to next? Where where are you going to be go doing? What am I going to be doing? So yep. uh, when this episode actually comes out, I will be at Closure Conch this time. Uh, I think you and I are doing very similar talks in just different places. We're talking about wrapping developer tooling in Docker containers, which is yep. kind of funny. Um, yeah, so it's that, de definitely a hot topic lately. Yeah. It, look, you just got to put container on it and then you're fine. That's, that's pretty <laughs> much what I've come down to. Um, but no, that's great. And then I, uh, in December, I will be at uh, DevFest uh, in Vancouver, uh, December 12th and 13th. If you're in the area, come on down. There'll be several of us. Uh, there'll be a few DAs, so it should be a good time. That sounds like it's lots of fun. Um, so on my side, I will actually, by the time this episode comes up, I will still be in Barcelona. Uh, that yep. will be the, la the last day of DockerCon. So that's where I'm heading on, uh, heading up, uh, Tomorrow, I'm going to Barcelona for DockerCon. And, and that's pretty much it. But I actually just wanted to mention also that I just came back from DevOx, where one of our colleagues, uh, so DevOx in Belgium, one of our colleagues gave an amazing demonstration of Kubernetes, which we talked about last week. Oh, uh, yeah, I heard about this. Yeah, on a cluster of Raspberry Pis, which is an amazing demonstration. You can basically unplug cables and see how pods get reallocated and so on. It's an amazing demo. So I, I will say, if you have a minute, go check it out. Okay, great. We have to put the uh, video in the show notes. That sounds fantastic. Great. Well, thank you once again, Frances, for joining me for recording. Much appreciated. Well, thank you, Mark, for waking up so early. <laughs> I also appreciate it. Uh, it was a great pleasure talking to you. So see you all next week. See you then.